and we're good. Great. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the uh, June JavaSig, New York JavaSig meeting. Thanks for uh, trekking all, all the way over here from, <laughs> from uh, our usual Credit Suisse hosts. Um, and thanks to QCon for hosting us at the hotel here. How many people here are attending QCon? Good. Fair amount of people. That's great. So um, tonight we have uh, two great speakers uh, talking with Steve and Nicholas to talk about Java SE8 and uh, Legos and other devices. And Nicholas from, am I pronounce this correctly? Aldebaran. So is that named after the star, Aldebaran? That's what we'd like to do with our robots, I guess. Yeah. But it's also <laughs> to say that it's a new territory to conquer. Okay. <laughs> so um, before I turn it over to these gentlemen, um, I, I take it it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a, a tag team type yeah. of presentation. Um, how many newcomers do we have here? Good. We have a couple of newcomers. So um, normally we have the first 15, 20 minutes for open Q&A. So if you have uh, questions about Java that maybe somebody next to you might be able to answer. This is the New York Java community. So we're the, uh, we're the, the biggest um, Java user group in North America. So your, your colleague next to you might be able to answer a question. So if you have any questions on Java um, that we might be able to answer, now is the time to do that. So we can maybe spend a few times. Now that we have two speakers, and we have the room until 9.30. Hey, Sai, how you doing? Um, now's the time. So if you have any questions on Java, anybody? All right, I'll, I'll add some incentive to this. <laughs> So, as, as you guys noticed, we're also live streaming and recording the talk here. Um, and folks who speak up during the presentation get one of the night hacking laptop stickers. So you can see I have one on my computer. Um, this is exclusive. Only people who are on the live stream can get these. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, ask a question about something now, um, and you get a sticker. Yeah. Um, pass the mic and also, Barry, Barry. <laughs> here, take this with you as on your way. Hi. Hi. Um, so I have a question got, uh, around Java 8 and the whole uh, stream, uh, well, the streams library and everything. Um, it's a basic question. So. Uh, why would I use it? Uh, why would I use it with? Uh, let's say I'm doing some query, whatever with, uh, filter. Why? Um, and I. What's the difference without uh, with putting a stream and not putting a stream? And should I have, uh, actually always go for a stream? Can okay. So make sense. I assume this question is directed at me, but if someone else wants to take a stab <laughs> at it, feel free. So, wh what sort of query are you trying to? Um, I don't know. Let's take something like sorting a collection, for example, by some predicate. Okay. All right. So let's take that example, like sorting a collection by a predicate. Um, so you could do it directly. Does everybody know what the Streams API is? Okay. I'll cover that as well. So the normal way you do it, like in Java 7, is you would take the your, your list of elements, and then you'd apply some sorting algorithm on the list. Um, and it would mutate the object in place, probably, like if it was an array list or something. Um, and that works fine, and will give you a you know fairly efficient resorting of the list. But if you were doing this on a very large list, and you wanted to take advantage of multiple processors, um, you would have to do your own algorithm for divvying up the work to multiple processors to do a parallel sort. One of the advantages of the Streams API so this is a new API introduced in Java 8, and it's the first kind of big example of how to use the new lambdas, um, the new the new lambdas feature, language feature of Java 8. One of the advantages of it is it has um, the Streams API supports parallelization of operations. So in that case, if you did a sort using the Streams API as opposed to just using um, like a static list sort on the array list. The Streams API could parallelize it across multiple processors and improve the efficiency for a large list. So, does that answer your question? Um, no, not entirely. Actually, I <laughs> should have made myself more clear. Um, and maybe that's more of a back. Uh, I presume the answer is a backward compa uh, compatibility. I'm actually looking not between parallelism and uh, being sequential. 
I'm just looking at just one sequence, uh, just in the sequential world, what's the difference in actually applying a filter and a predicate between a filter and a predicate with a stream? Is there actually any difference or is it just done that, I mean, why do we actually have the stream instead of just part of the call? Okay, so why use streams instead of doing it kind of the old-fashioned way? Yeah, kind of. Well, not for a loop, but you can just do right collection dot sort whatever the filter collect is by blah, blah, yeah, blah, blah. Yeah, okay. No, actually putting the stream before that. I mean, if you put the stream, yes, you can do it as parallel stream as well, but you have the stream dot stream and dot parallel stream, right? And uh, I'm just wondering what's the... Uh, yeah, so, I mean, I guess the advantage, if you, if you don't care about parallelism... Um, the main advantage you'd get is if you were chaining operations together using the streams API, so you could have filters or maps or other operations interspersed. Um, if the only thing you're doing is sorting a mutable array, then you could just sort it on a single processor in place. Yeah, Barry? What about the argument about the clarity of the code? I think there's something to say there, is that you can write an algorithm that's more readable at a glance with parallel with uh, with um, lambdas than without them. Yeah, I mean, for more complicated cases, I think that applies. But I think that's a good, a fair question. I, get, I actually, I get asked whenever I give my lambdas talks about, as a Java developer, why would I want to um, start using lambdas? And I think it's a, it's a common question because it is a lot of new API and language feature to learn. Um, but you do get a lot of benefits, both it makes a lot of use cases much easier and simpler to write. And the Streams API is just one example of it. Um, I think what you're going to see is a lot of Java APIs are start co going to start adopting Lambda's features. And then um, newer versions of APIs, you'll get significant benefits. For example, there's great cases of like um, object relational mapping or other cases of tools you use in existing Java EE applications, where if you used a functional style of programming that Lambdas encourages, you can get significant um, kind of syntactic um, benefits. Okay. Any other questions? Sure. Any more And the default implementation and a default uh, AP, um, interface, if I am correct, actually, I have just seen it last week. Is this something that uh, that will uh, support a kind of uh, multi inheritance? Okay, so it itself it is kind of a form. Okay. Yes, the question was about default. Um, essentially, the new extension extension methods. You can add implementations to interfaces. And the question was whether it would support multiple inheritance in the future, right? Yeah. So it's, it's kind of a form of multiple inheritance because you can have multiple implementations. But I believe right now it's fail fast on compilation if you have multiple, um, multiple implementations defined for different interfaces you implement, then it'll be an error. Um, so you have to unimplement one of those interfaces for it to actually work. Um, but I think part of the, d the reason for the design was they wanted to try to avoid the common pitfalls with like the diamond operator scenario for multiple inheritance, because it can get fairly complicated in general multiple inheritance scenarios for resolution of, of which method gets called. Um, but that would be a great question for Brian Getz, <laughs> who was walking around the conference today. <laughs> future, future Java language questions like that, usually Brian Getz and Mark Reinhold are the people I ask. <laughs> <laughs> to find out what their plans are. So, um, oh, yeah. actually, speaking of Brian Getz, we have uh, some things to raffle off at Here. the end of you can end of the talk. It. So, uh, actually, we have a book signed by Brian who said he's going to be working on Java 10 features next, <laughs> 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 which is that's four years from now. Um, so if there aren't any other questions, oh, also we have some t-shirts to raffle off too. So I don't want to carry the box back home, so I want to get rid of all the t-shirts. <laughs> so let me turn everything over to, uh, to Steve and Nicholas. Cool. Thanks, Frank. So um, this will be a fairly interactive, um, kind of informal session. We both have lots of hardware and cool stuff to show you. 
Um, would you mind standing there as a model behind my laptop so I can focus the camera, Nicholas? And you guys are free to ask us questions as we go along, so don't be shy. Yeah, that's perfect. Good enough. And I have lots of cool stuff to show you, so let me give you a, a preview of some of, the, some of the fun toys which we get to play around with today. Okay, so, um, oh, that's me. I work for Oracle as a Java technology ambassador. And some of the cool stuff we're going to get to play around with today includes the Lego Mindstorms. Um, so all of these different devices, you may or may not know, actually run Java SE Embedded which is what I'll be showing you guys today. Let me take that off. No, go there. PowerPoint does not like me. OK. Uh, maybe. All right, so Lego Mindstorms um, runs Java SE Embedded. This is the latest version, the EV3. Um, the Raspberry Pi, I'm going to show you some examples on, which is a really great um, starting development platform. The Duke Pad is a homebrew tablet, which I'll show you guys. We built this using a Raspberry Pi, and the entire case is um, laser cut from plastic acrylic. Um, and I'll also show you Java running on some devices you may have on your person, including iOS and Android. So, we have lots of fun stuff. Um, and I want to do an overlay. Overlay. Hold on just a sec while I um, modify my shot. Wonderful. All right, now you can see me and the slide side by side. This is, this is what you get for being your own AV tech and demo person and presenter all in one. All right, so the first one I want to show you guys, or the first thing I want to talk about is a little bit about the Internet of Things in general. Um, so I'll refer to this a few times in the presentation, but really what the Internet of Things ab is about is um, working with different interconnected devices. And this is some data from Cisco on the number of devices per person on average. So we're already outnumbered by our own devices. I'm sure most of you have at least a cell phone on you, possibly a laptop and, you know, a few other random devices. Anyone have like a, what are they called, like Fitbits or fuel bands or... Um, Step monitors. Oh, okay. A few folks. So you, the number of devices for healthcare, for home automation, for different consumer scenarios is increasing. And there's also a bunch of industrial applications for this. Um, you know, in planes, um, entertainment systems in planes, in cars, um, in manufacturing plants to do more automation. So there's a whole bunch of different areas where this is taking place. And really... What we're seeing is a change from devices tra talking directly to the internet to webs of devices, where you have different devices um, interconnected and talking to each other. Um, so, for example, like if you guys have, um, you know, some sort of step monitor or fuel band, that probably hooks up either to your laptop or to a mobile device rather than going directly to the internet. Um, and with low power networking op options like um, Bluetooth LE. Um, and protocols like MQTT, we're seeing more sensor networks and meshes of devices talking to each other. Um, and Java is a really great platform for running on small devices like this. 
Um, I'll be talking a little bit about Java ME and Java SE. Java ME runs on the Centurion EHS5. This is a really, really tiny chip, and it basically is about the size of your finger, but includes a ARM processor that can run Java ME, as well as a 3G antenna, um, or rather 3G processing, and you can hook up an antenna via the pinouts on the back. Um, you can also hook up a battery and different sensors and then put together an entire development um, scenario like this. So this is one of the use cases they use the Centurion chips in was to track rainforest deforestation. So they would plant the chips plus a, um, a battery and then some sensors like an accelerometer and a 3G antenna. So they'd know when somebody um, knocked over the trees based upon the motion, and then they could track the location that the trees were being taken away to um, to prevent the um, illegal deforestation of the trees. And you could think of plenty of other scenarios where having 3G embedded in devices like um, kiosks or vending machines would allow you to do things where you normally don't have connectivity using Java and a small solution like that. Um, so that's a Java ME scenario, and I think it's important to distinguish between Java ME and Java SE. In general, I'll be talking about Java Embedded during the presentation, but um, historically, there's been a pretty big divide between Java ME and Java SE. Java ME is targeted at really small form factors and devices, and the language level which it, was, which it supported in Java 7 and prior was only Java 1.3 or Java 1.4, and the APIs were um, fairly different. There were a whole bunch of JSRs for mobile devices, um, which weren't supported on desktop, and likewise, a whole bunch of desktop APIs which are not supported in Java ME. With the Java 8 release, um, we've increased the amount of APIs available to the ME profile, um, and likewise, pushed some of the device-specific things back into Java SE. And same thing for the language level. The language level for Java ME 8 is, includes a much larger subset of Java Eight, not lambdas yet, but um, we're working on improving it to the point where the languages will be almost the same for developing Java ME and Java SE, and there should be um, almost full overlap between the APIs running on mobile and um, desktop, except for um, the profile you're using. So Java 8 also introduced a bunch of compact profiles where you can take the whole JDK and then trim it down to a bunch of different sizes based upon which APIs you need. For example, on a small embedded platform, you probably don't need Corva. I'm not sure anybody needs Corva. <laughs> but if you think about over the years how much um, kind of APIs and things have um, grown into the language, this is extremely important to keep the footprint, especially on mobile and embedded platforms, down. And it's also being utilized in Java EE. There's a new web profile as well, which lets you trim down um, the Java deployment if you're using cloud-based services and you have an, have, if you're trying to keep your footprint low on um, the Java EE side. Uh, so Java ME is not using cell phones, is that right? Um, so you mind repeating the question for the mic? Is Java ME used in cell phones? OK, so that's an excellent question. Um, so Java ME, actually the origin was with um, feature phones. So I think it originally it stood for mobile edition, Java mobile ed micro edition. OK. Um, but um, given the, f the new focus, so Java ME was never really widely adopted on um, smartphones. And given the new focus on embedded platforms, which is a really good use case for Java ME, um, which works well on small devices. Um, this is the new focus for all the Java ME development, and that's why there's a big push to increase the language level and the features which it supports. So if you've done any Java ME development historically, this would be a good time to take a second look at it. <laughs> um, and if you've done any C development, are there any C hackers in the audience, embedded C hackers? Okay, so you've done a little bit of hacking on different devices? Um, historically, there are a lot more hurdles to overcome to do C development on embedded platforms. And a lot of things which Java developers take for granted, like having garbage collection, um, having easy portability between different chips and architectures, having a, you know, a big community and user groups like this one, 
um, the C development community, especially the embedded C development, really hasn't had. So ha running Java on small devices is another way for um, C developers to increase their efficiency and um, their ability to, to crank out new libraries and applications quickly. Okay, so more information in general about IoT. Go to the IoT community site. Can you pass the microphone back, Barry? There's a question. Sorry, a quick question. Is embedded here being used similarly to mobile? So when I see embedded, does that include I can run on mobile or is it embedded means more and mobile is a, a subset of that? Okay, so um, th I think the best way of thinking about it, I'll talk a little bit about running Java on smartphones at the end of this section. But um, all the stuff I'm talking about embedded, it's specifically for um, writing applications on like ARM or um, MIPS-based processors for embedding it inside of other devices or using in other scenarios. Um, I think I would treat mobile computing, um, smartphones and tablets, as kind of a different area. It's, it's related in terms of they're both used ARM-based processors, but it's different in terms of the, the use cases and how you deploy applications and work with technologies. But that's a good question. And another one on your right. Uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to ask this question because I, just, I used to see it a lot, but uh, not recently. Uh, what happened to real-time Java? I mean, it, it, it seems to be gone from the website completely. Okay. That's, that's an excellent question, which I... know, it's a little bit I, track, No, 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 it's, it's a really good question, <laughs> which I don't know the answer to. <laughs> so if, if you're really curious, um, shoot me an email, and I'll, I'll ask one of the product managers what, what the story with real-time Java is. <laughs> Yeah. I, I just wanted to quickly come to the defense of embedded C. Um, you, were, um, you mentioned that embedded C is missing some things that are in Java, like garbage collection, and that's true, but you don't need it in embedded C. In embedded C, you typically are running on a much cheaper, slower, smaller processor, like a PIC, as opposed to an ARM. So it, it's kind of... It, it, it has a different place than, than Java does, I think. Java yeah, no, no, I think, I think that's an, an excellent point. Um, so if you, I think if you look historically at embedded development, really the devices you were targeting were very, very low power, very me little memory, and you had to kind of micromanage resources at a very fine-grained level. Um, most of the, the chips now, um, you know, they have common architectures and a reasonable amount of memory. Um, and they're increasingly, they've done great, great things with the, um, the power levels uh, that you can get at a given performance level. So you can start having larger processors and more memory without impacting your power levels for small chips. And I think that's probably been the biggest driver in terms of taking higher level languages and applying them to embedded development. But that's a, that's a very good perspective. Thanks. Um, so the first device I'm going to talk about. Oh yeah, yeah. Go is there ahead. a is there a uh, processor limit for embedded Java? Um, there is for Java SE, which is what I'm going to be talking about. Really, the smallest processor we support is um, the ARM 11, which is the processor in the Raspberry Pi. This is actually an ARM 9, so I guess we support slightly smaller. And you need to have a reasonable amount of memory on chip. Um, Java ME supports much smaller configurations, and if you're if you're curious about like the exact thresholds, again, I'll defer to um, the product manager, either Jay or one of the guys who's in the weeds on this, and they they have exact numbers for like Java ME requires this minimum um, amount of memory and processor, etc. Java SE requires this minimum, um, and typically. There's not a lot of overlap between the two. The Raspberry Pi is the one platform which it happens to be the reference platform for both Java ME and Java SE, but you wouldn't typically run Java ME on it. It's much too large. And Java SE, it's kind of close to the minimum you can actually get good performance from. Okay, thank you. All right, good question. Yeah? Uh, well, hold, hold on, hold on for our, our, excellent, our excellent microphone. You're, 
You're, I think you've earned a few stickers of your own, Barry. <laughs> Don't give them all away. <laughs> I, uh, I read about uh, GPU, running Java in GPU. So yeah. is, is that embedded? Is that considered embedded too? Or okay, all right. So Java it? on GPU, um, you're probably referring to maybe Project Sumatra? Yeah. Okay. So that typically that's designed so you can run um, Java applications using like OpenCL to get very high performance. Um, it's I would say it's distinct from the embedded use case. So on embedded platforms, you have GPUs in a lot of cases. Like the Raspberry Pi has a very good GPU, and sometimes you can get benefits from utilizing the GPU. But most of the stuff I'm going to show you, the GPU is being utilized for graphics, not for normal processing. Um, most of the cases where people are looking at like high performance computing using the GPU, it's more on the server side for Java in particular. If you're doing like cloud-based computing or large-scale processing in servers, you can get huge benefits from utilizing GPUs because it's typically lower power and better performance than the equivalent CPU operations if you can optimize it. Um, so in the future, would the simulators and emulators on PCs and Macs be able to run with one single Java? Or would I still have to have multiple Java SDKs on my PC or Mac? OK, so I'm not sure. Hold, hold on to the mic, because I want to make sure I understand the question. Um, so you're comparing PCs, PC and Mac computers, and you're wondering uh, why there are different versions of Java for them? Right. For, for let's say if I wanted to run a simulator or an emulator for something I'm developing for a embedded device, okay, would I would I continue to use a single JDK or would there be separate um, instances that I would have to run for emulating or simulating the particular application? Emulating an application, okay. Now <laughs> you've really lost me. <laughs> give me give me a specific okay, let's use case. I, I, I wrote an application for some device, but I wanted to test it out on you know, whatever PC I have. Okay. How would I do it in the future when, you know, uh, post Java 8? Okay, are you talking about embedded development or desktop development? Yeah. Embedded development, and you're trying to emulate? A device. A device. Okay. All right, so I guess that's the first part, is the emulation part. Um, I know that they have emulators of sorts for mobile platforms. But typically for embedded platforms, um, the easier route is actually to test it on device on rather device. than emulate it. Um, as far as I know, there's, there's not a lot of emulators available for ARM processors in general. And there's a whole bunch of different development boards and configurations. So trying to test those on desktop reliably would probably be challenging. Um, one of the guys on the team who I, I'm actually going to show him in one of the later slides, his, his name's Gary Collins. And he does all of the device testing at Oracle. So his, he is the coolest office <laughs> in our building. <laughs> he basically has like a wall of different devices and platforms um, running ARM and MIPS and all sorts of different processors. And um, he, he, he almost treats it like a lab. Like people can um, SSH into them and test different stuff on them to test um, Java software running on a variety of different embedded platforms. But to get them working, he has to do all sorts of quirky stuff with getting the right um, system images and building custom kernels and um, serial tipping in to fix stuff. Probably You're probably familiar with this if you've done embedded development. It's quite, working with a variety of different platforms is extremely challenging at times. OK, but good question. Yes. Um, so demos. <laughs> We've been talking for a while. <laughs> I think we need to actually show some demos. <laughs> All right, so the first demo we're going to show is, what's this guy's name? Duke. Duke. All right, very good. And this is not any Duke. This is Lego Duke. He's running Lego Mindstorms, um, the EV3 version. So this is the first version of Lego Mindstorms, which is actually powerful enough to run a full JVM on it. Um, I'm using Lahos, which is, it's been around for a while, but this version of Lahos, actually rather than cross-compiling, it just runs directly off jar piles. You can compile on desktop. Um, so since this is a full JVM, you can actually test and compile everything on desktop before moving it over and just copy your jar file over. 
and I'm using the EV3 hardware. So it has large motors for the wheels um, and small motors to move the arms. Um, a gyroscope for controlling the balance. So this is a segue in, in essence. Um, so he's going to balance on two wheels for us. There's a push button to get him started. Um, color and light sensors, ultrasonic sensor as well. And an infrared sensor. The ultrasonic sensor comes with the education kit. Um, the infrared sensor comes with the retail kit. So we're going to use the infrared sensor plus a remote control to control this guy. Um, and then, you know, that's the remote control and a little bit of information about how to get started with Lejos. With Lejos, the way it works is you load it on an SD card, so you don't even need to um, flash or replace the existing firmware on the device. And um, it runs inside of a Linux distribution. And um, you can basically code in any ID you want, unless you actually want to build the Lejos sources from scratch, in which case the, the team seems to use Eclipse, so that's the easiest one to get started with. But they have full distributions and system images. Um, and basically, all you end up doing is you create an application which depends on the EV3 class's jar file, which adds in some additional APIs so you can do stuff like this. So this is Hello World for Lejos running on LEGO Mindstorms. So it'll print, you know, first EV3 program on the LCD screen. Yeah? Um, where's the... Hold on. <laughs> Barry is optimally seated to get to anybody in the room now. Yeah, what is the relation between Lejos and Java? Um, so it's an open source project. Lejos is an open source project. I believe it's it's run by some folks from the university. Um, I should know all their names. No, it's just an API. It's just um, libraries, which you can use. And basically, what Lejos gives you is it gives you a simple API for accessing the motors and the sensors and all those devices from Java. So they take care of all that part. And then we have a special Java SE embedded build for the LEGO Mindstorms. So for the demo, I need a volunteer who is a parent. Who's a parent in the audience? OK, so blue shirt, yeah, come on up. Um, so you're probably wondering why I care that he's a dad. <laughs> but, OK, see this? This is a dad hold, two hands. Baby hold, good job. <laughs> we, we had a little accident when I was in Switzerland with somebody one-handing Duke. <laughs> so I, I learned my lesson from that. And anybody done like um, remote control cars or planes? Anyone feel confident enough to use our controller? <laughs> yeah, OK. Come on up, um, blue shirt. Two blue shirts. All right, so I'm going to kick this off, and then I'll, I'll switch the monitor so the big screen's showing Duke, so you guys don't have to all get up and crawl up to the front of the room. Um, what's the IP address on our buddy Duke? It's the second one. Should be 10.01 something. Uh, wait a sec. Okay, actually, we're not going to do this, because this will kill my streaming connection if I hook up to a second network. So, hold on just a sec. This is why we always carry two laptops. Remember I was talking about number of devices per person <laughs> coming up? <laughs> I, think, I think I'm um, pushing the limit. All right. All right. So, what's the IP address on that guy? On the back of on the back of this guy. Ten zero one four. Okay. I want the second one. Yep. Four is the magic one. Okay. So I already copied over the. Um, 
the jar file from my desktop, which is just a simple Java application which does the Segway algorithm. So he should be booted up and running now. Let me futz with the camera. Huh? Hello, where it explodes. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, hopefully not. Um, and um, a anyone experienced using a DSLR camera? Anyone have like a Nikon or Canon DSLR? Okay, so anyone else? Okay, would you mind helping me for a sec here? Um, so the video camera here, it's just a Nikon DSLR. Um, this is the zoom ring, focus ring. And see if you can get some shots of the, um, the robot as I explain it to these guys. All right, so um, you're gonna be the balancer. Okay. So you wanna lie him on his back, on top of the backpack on the ground. So just put him down. Well, his other back. Other side, right? <laughs> now, um, w when you press the button in his right hand, don't do it yet, but when you press that, mm -hmm. then he's gonna start beeping, okay. and you wanna lift him up and balance him on his wheels at his center of gravity. Okay. Um, so see if you can get him to stand upright. Wait, 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 first lay him down. Press the button and wait till he starts beeping, and now stand him up. Yeah. And hold on to him for a sec. Let go. Okay, good. Excellent. You don't need to take pictures because it's, it's constantly on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I got help from one of the guys on the, Pi, on the Lejos project. Um, so, um, your job is to remote control the robot. So on the joystick, did I give you? Oh, I didn't give it to you yet. Okay, here's your remote. So, um, other way. Um, the sensor is in his, um, kind of his buttock area. And when you press the buttons, each time it increments a counter. So don't hold them in, just click it a few times. That one, that's left. Yeah. Okay, so now you should be turning. This one's right. If you want to stop him from turning, just press the center button and that cancels his action cue. Um, sometimes you have to get point at his back or it won't work or get closer. And that's forward. The blue bottom one is forward. The red bottom one is backwards. Yeah, so just hop behind him. Find a good, a good spot to aim. <laughs> oh, there he goes. Now he's going a little faster. Um, he, our little Lego Duke actually prefers um, hardwood floors or um, solid surfaces, but he does okay on carpets. It's it's kind of a balancing game of the algorithm. You have to. There's a few parameters you can pass into the Segway algorithm for like the wheel size and how sensitive he is. Um, yeah, there's a gyroscope inside of him, and then whenever he f sees that he's leaning over, he'll speed up the motors or slow down the motors to, to try to keep his balance. Can't control him with radio waves. Um, you might be able to hook up like a RF transmitter to one of the sensor ports. They sell some third-party sensors for that are not made by Lego but made by third-party companies. I don't know if there's any RF sensors though. I mean really if you want to do a lot of hardware hacking I'd recommend the Raspberry Pi. It's a much better platform. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Okay, so give these guys a round of applause. They did an excellent job. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Why did you need the IP address? What what was the comp what was the laptop doing? Oh, uh, so all I did is I just booted up the program. I could set it to automatically run when he starts up, but then you guys would never actually believe that I coded anything. <laughs> um, and once he's running, it's autonomous, so you don't actually need to be hooked up to him once the Java program's executed. Um, and you could add it as a, a startup action in the inetd file if you wanted to. Um, you know, have him do it right from the start. Yeah, it, it is. Um, I believe 
that. Uh, question was: on. Is the code for this available? Yeah. So the answer the answer is yes. But the answer as to where you would get it, <laughs> I'm trying to remember as I rewire my second demo, which has some disconnected wires for some reason. Uh, so this Java support the protocol like HTTP? Can you repeat that? Well, this uh, uh, program, in other words, you, you, uh, as long as you have an IP address, that sort of implies you can use the HTTP with the unit. Is that true? So you could control it th through a web page? Um, yes. Yes, you. OK. So I guess I'm, I'm not sure how easy it would be to run a full web server on the, Pi, on the LEGO Mindstorms, because it's not that powerful. I see. But you can definitely do like HTTP requests from Lego Mindstorms if you wanted to like hit a page and pull down data, get data from a REST service or something like that. That would be entirely doable. Um, but yeah, that's a good question. Was the um, was the remote control controlled by uh, Bluetooth LE? Uh, the remote control is just using. Um, Infrared. Oh, infrared. Oh, okay. yeah. Oh, that's why he had to keep walking around. <laughs> exactly. Line of, line of sight only, and it depends on the lighting in the room. Wouldn't um, Bluetooth be feasible? Yeah. So um, I think the this guy actually has full Bluetooth support. Oh. So you could hook up via Bluetooth and do it directly via Bluetooth if you wanted to. Um, and the other connectivity is you can use USB. And also, I have a Wi-Fi dongle to hook up, so we could also use Wi-Fi to control him. So, yeah, those are other options as well. Was there another question? I heard somebody. Yeah. So, I I think if you're question doing is, does if you're doing supported out of the box. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure if you're using like Wi-Fi, that would be super easy because it would just look like network configuration for it. Um, doing stuff. I haven't tried to do any stuff with Lehos over Bluetooth. So I've, I used, can't I've used Bluetooth on the middle version, the not this third version, yeah, the NXT? but the number two. Okay. And uh, I don't remember if it was easy or hard, but it certainly worked. It, and it, it wasn't, works. Yeah. Okay. That's the right answer. We like stuff which works. Okay. So, next demo I'm going to show is the Raspberry Pi. Um, I have a little embedded board here. It has the, the Raspberry Pi is actually the green board on this setup. Um, I'm powering it from a normal cell phone charger, so it needs about an amp of power over micro USB. And you can hook a full display up to this, um, like a computer. So it has USB ports you could hook a mouse and keyboard up to, um, an HDMI, which you could hook a display up to. But in this case, um, rather than doing that, I'm hooking up the breadboard to the GPIO pins the general purpose I.O. pins. And I have a few sensors hooked up. One is a pressure sensor, and the other is a touch sensor. So I think this is kind of, you know, if you're going to bother doing embedded hardware, you actually better to use it for what it's good for, like sensors and physical interaction, rather than just using it as a computer. Because it, it's a pretty sucky computer. <laughs> um, think about it, like, processing power-wise, it's kind of like a Pentium... Pentium 4 from years ago um, with a modern GPU. So um, what I have hooked up here is both a pressure sensor and a light sensor. And I have a small application which we're going to use as a sample to show this working. Um, let me see if he's actually hooked up to the network or not yet. Oh, OK. Looks like you just hooked up. And you know, same trick. I'm going to SSH into the board um, and then run some stuff on it directly. Okay. 
and I need a few volunteers to help me out. So who's the who's the strongest member of the New York Java SIG? That's a weird question. <laughs> We'll, we'll, we'll make it up after we see how they do. Anyone want to be a volunteer? Okay, come on up. Okay, and did I hook it up? Oh, okay. Somehow <laughs> I wired this correctly, amazingly. Okay, and um, would you mind helping us out with the camera again? Just, I mean, do the best you can to get a shot of, of what I'm holding in, in focus. Yeah. Okay. So basically, um, on the board here, you can see we have a force reading and a photo reading. Um, yeah. There, now you can kind of see it. And here is a force sensor, and there's a photo cell sensor here. So for the force sensor, just grab it with your two fingers and squeeze it, and see how high you can get the number to go up. Okay. So, really, <laughs> really strong. <laughs> that, that is amazing strength. Uh -huh, and it's working again. So, you can give it a second try if you want. All right. And I see 15, 50, 15. Okay. Pretty good. And then see if you can cover the light sensor a little bit. Okay, so it's, it's well, get it a little bit lower. You can touch it, yeah. Uh, 700, 800, 600. Okay. So basically the way this demo works is um, the pressure sensor picks up how much pressure you're putting on it. It's not like a scale, it's not absolute weight measurement, but it gives you a relative scale. And the light sensor here is pick it's a photocell sensor, so it's picking up light from the room. So if you cover this, you can get the value fairly low. And this is all being read by the analog to digital chip here, which is hooked up to the Raspberry Pi via I squared C. And then it displays on this little um, L C D board. Is that sensor uh, sensitive enough to uh, measure your blood pulse your 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 pulse? Um this well it's this probably not because you need to put apply a fair amount of pressure to get a reading. Um, but I do know that they have pulse oximeters. Um, and there's some we've been playing around that work over Bluetooth for embedded scenarios. And you could hook those up via Bluetooth dongle to Raspberry Pi, ret Bluetooth to the pulse ox, and then get pulse oximeter readings if you want to do healthcare scenarios. Mm. All right, okay. so Great. thanks very much. Thank you. Give them a round of applause. So that's a quick example of what you can do with the Raspberry Pi. Um, now the Raspberry Pi, besides being used for um, embedded scenarios, also has a pretty nice video card, graphics card as I mentioned. And as a result, you can run full tablet user interfaces on it, such as um, JavaFX. So how many, how many folks here have tried JavaFX on desktop? OK, a few folks. So if you've never played with JavaFX before, it's the, basically the successor to Swing in AWT. Um, it's a full desktop <laughs> graphics toolkit. <coughs> And probably one of the best cross-platform toolkits available right now. So if you're building desktop applications, it's a really good choice. Unfortunately, not, not a lot of us are getting paid to build desktop applications right now. <laughs> but it's really good um, for embedded scenarios as well. So this is what we call the, the Duke pad. Um, on the back, you can see inside of it. So it has a Raspberry Pi. Um, USB hub. Normally there's a battery here. I've replaced that with a um, HDMI splitter. It has the Pi camera, which you can use to take photos or video. 
and an LCD screen. So it's using the chalkboard electronics LCD screen. So basically all the components are things you can buy off the shelf relatively inexpensively. And the case itself is just laser cut. Um, so we went to the local San, San Jose tech shop and then laser cut the case. Um, would you mind helping me out with the camera and see the best view you can get of this? And I'll try not to move too much. Okay, perfect. So that's the user interface. The entire user interface is written in JavaFX and it's been open sourced. Um, one of the new features in JavaFX 8 is 3D. <laughs> All right, so there's really good 3D support. You can import full models from programs like Maya, um, use proper 3D primitives. Um, it also gets fairly good performance if you optimize your application. So this is a little game that's entirely written in JavaFX. Um, and all these applications are distributed as OSGI bundles on the Raspberry Pi. So you can add your own applications and games really easily. Okay, so there I beat the first level. And um, here's an example of video. What do you guys prefer, Java 1 trailer or Iron Man video? <laughs> Java, one. Java 1? Okay, those are hardcore <laughs> Java guys. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, some people really like the Java, <laughs> the Java videos, but um, not, not everyone. Okay, so this is this is um, you know full 720p video running on the on the Raspberry Pi. Okay, and wow, that is funky and choppy. Okay, my Raspberry Pi is not very happy right now for some reason, but normally <laughs> this works really well for doing um, full quality video. Um, one of the common use cases for Raspberry Pi, actually what I hear people most often doing about it when I ask them what to do with their Pis, is they install XBMC and they use it as a home media center for playing video. Let's try Iron Man, see if he's happier. Or it might just, it might just be my, my Raspberry Pi is unhappy and needs to be reset. Okay, yeah, so for some reason that video is not playing properly, but... Iron Man's working great. Okay, so you can see the video in the backgrounds, and then you ha there's an overlay of JavaFX controls on top. So you could use this for like menus or doing a home media um, player setup. Um, and the Raspberry Pi has a really good GPU for decoding video like this, even though the processor is weak, as I mentioned earlier. The GPU is quite capable. Okay, so that's a little bit about the Duke pad. Um, let me show you some more details about that. Okay, so this is um, some pictures of the construction of the Duke pad. So it's, as I mentioned, cut out of laser cut acrylic um, with all the components inside of it. This is the actual laser cutter that we were using. Um, so it has a, a sheet of paper backing it so it doesn't burn the plastic and then you just peel that off and then pop out the different components after it's cut. Um, here's some of the internal components and the layer cake of acrylic being built up with the components being added. And um, here's my buddy Gary Collins I mentioned. Good guy to know if you want to visit his office and check out all his hardware. Um, and he also helped me a lot of the demos which I'm showing. And if you want to get more information about the Duke pad, you can go to what's cut off there is j.mp slash Duke pad. And it has the schematics, the hardware you need to buy if you wanted to build one, as well as all the open source software. Um, so all of the applications I showed you and the actual kind of operating system is all fully open sourced if you wanted to try this out. Okay, and the last thing I want to mention before we start playing with robots is some examples of using Java on iPhones and Oh, 
All right, let me give you a hint. This is the ASUS Transformer Prime. So it's an Android tablet, Android tablet, and, ah, here we go. Smartwatch, yeah, this is um, the very finest China knockoff smartwatch, the ZG PAX. But it's it's Android compatible smartwatch. Um, you could also use the was it the Gear Samsung Gear? Yeah, that works that works as well. Yeah, this one actually has a slightly faster processor and much worse battery life <laughs> than the Samsung Gear. But you get you get what you pay for. Okay, so I'm gonna attempt. Do 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 do. to show you this on the camera. Okay, so first one I'm gonna show you is, um, no, nope, no, nope, don't do that. Running RoboVM, okay. Oh. All right, kind of see that. So this is a little application that's built using RoboVM. It took all of like, Half an hour to get it up and running. Has a little fishy that follows your mouse as it goes around. And like half a day to deal with stupid iStore phone provisioning <laughs> and security credentials and all that stuff. And that's from somebody who's done quite a lot of iOS hacking in the past. Um, every time I touch it, my credentials are outdated and I need to refresh them and all this funk. Um, okay. So that's running on iOS. And then, come on, wake up. Do. Okay, so if I can point it the right way, we won't get too much light on the screen. Um, so, anyone here last year for my Lambda's talk at the jug? Okay, Frank was here. <laughs> So if you were here last year, you should recognize this game. Mary had a little Lambda, and it works really well on Android. So we've colored our sheep, and then we'll you know, feed them, get some eggs, get some chickens, and finally, fox. Okay, fed the fox. All right, so pass this around, Frank. And the last one. Um, try not to exit out of the application by clicking the return button because you won't find it again easily. Aha. Uh -huh. So it looks like a clock. It's actually an Android phone, and I've installed a JavaFX application called Clock2, developed by Garrett Grunwald, and basically it displays the time as words. So 10 past 3. That's not the right time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you can change the color by swiping. Jira. You can double tap it to go from words to um, um, visual. Um, but it's a really cool application. And so you, you notice that the, here, pass this around. The devices I'm showing, the UIs are tailored for specific form factors. So I think one of the things to keep in mind when you're developing um, for different form factors and devices is the type of user interface you design for different applications um, really varies quite a bit. Okay. So the, the obvious question is, well, how can I develop for these different platforms? Where can I get RoboVM? All that good stuff. Oh, come on, let me switch. Presentations, PowerPoint. Okay, there we go. Um, so, the iOS application is developed using RoboVM. This is a cross compiler which cross compiles Java code into native code for running an iOS platform. It's using the open JFX libraries for the user interface. So, that's the open source version of JavaFX. Um, and there's already a bunch of applications deployed to the App Store using this technology. 
Um, so you can use this for development purposes. You don't have to jailbreak your phone because it just looks like a normal Java or normal iOS application. And from Apple's purposes as well, um, there's plenty of precedence for using third-party frameworks as well as cross-compilers to develop for applications. The only thing they explicitly disallow is dynamic um, recompilation of code. Um, so this is why, for example, you can't run a just-in-time compiler on um, iOS. And then for the Android code, what I'm using is JavaFX ports. Again, this is based upon um, the OpenJFX project for the user interface. So exactly the same code runs on Android and iOS. The difference here is that rather than cross-compiling, this runs on top of the um, Dalvik code running directly on the Android device. So your first question should be, well, if you're using Dalvik to run your application, how are you showing a Java 8 application <laughs> running on the tablet? And um, I'm using retro lambdas for that, which is a way of backporting lambdas to Java 7 and prior. Um, so and I, this project, the JavaFX supports project, is run by Johan Voss. Um, so he's um, one of the DevOps program committee guys, very active in the community, and very interested in seeing folks adopt JavaFX and Java in general on Android devices. So this gives you a nice solution for developing on desktop, embedded platforms, as well as mobile platforms, all using similar application bases. OK, so question was, thanks, Barry. Um, is this with the blessing of Oracle? So we don't have official support for any mobile platform. So you can't buy like an Oracle support contract, Oracle licensing for this stuff. Um, both of these examples I showed you for Android and iOS are based upon the OpenJFX project, which has code that was originally developed by Oracle engineers, but is not something that we formally support via our normal support channels. If we do provide embedded board support, for um, ARM processors, Raspberry Pi, and soon MIPS processors. Um, we also provide you know, um, enterprise support for desktop, but not directly for mobile. Although you can get support from RoboVM and other companies which are doing this. And will, Art? Will, will Art, it'll work with, with Art as well as uh, Dalvik, I guess? Um, what was the question again? Will it work with the, their new uh, system, Art, yeah, okay. So it works with the new newer JVM as well. Yeah. yeah. There's I think there's an what, what's the name of the older JVM? It's not Dalvik, but there was an official name for the Dalvik's the cross compiler. But anyway, the the new Android JVM works as well. I have my sixth version of the same question that I asked earlier today. <laughs> um, so let's say I write a swing app and I just dispose of the uh, main method and embed it inside the onCreate method in an Android activity, um, will that work? I have to, I, I, I realize once I get a dot .class file, I have to uh, make it into an APK file with Dalvik, but is that the kind of thing that would work? Okay, so what do you want to do? You want to... So I want to write a standard Java app. Okay. And... Um, just leave off the main because Dalvik doesn't want that uh -huh. and put it inside an activity because Dalvik wants that and then um, turn it into a class file. Oh, I guess I first, for, no. Yeah, well, you compile it into class files and then use the Dalvik cross compiler right. to compile it to the Android Now that I think code. about it, though, it, to compile it into a class file, oh, heck, I'll try it on my own. <laughs> yeah, so if... If you guys are interested to give the Android support a try, um, there's, there's some good guides by Johan and other folks in the community who have been doing this. And they also have a bunch of build scripts which automate most of the part from getting to your Java codes into an APK file. Um, you just have to have the Android SDK installed um, because it uses, obviously, the, the Dalvik cross compiler. Um, and then a modern version of Java um, Java 6 or Java 7. So, but give it a try, and then if you run into any trouble, I'll be happy to introduce you to Johan, who can help. So qu the question I have is, uh, how, how serious is Oracle about this? Is it 
going to its use case will say, you know, should I develop in Android? Uh, Java, or should I develop in FX? Is there going to be a push to make this an alternative, or is it just a toy uh, for people to play with? Okay, so I, I think that's a fair question. Now, from the official Oracle standpoint, we have no plans to support this, either now or in the future. Um, personally, you know, I'm JavaFX book author <laughs> and JavaFX community member, and I run a actually run a Java user group, the Silicon Valley JavaFX user group. So this, this is exciting to me. <laughs> but I'm not going to tell you, especially not as an Oracle employee, I'm not going to tell you to bank your business on emerging technologies like this. Um, this is something which I think works really well, and it's good for hobby projects. But I wouldn't necessarily recommend that you go and tell your boss that you're going to rewrite your existing Android and iOS applications. world or yeah yeah I think there's there's lots of precedence precedence for um, cross compilation or cross development frameworks like this and you know this is this is really a good option for Java developers you don't need to switch languages or platforms you get a lot more capabilities than you do by just writing JavaScript based applications so it's it gives you a lot more power but at the same time I mean part probably the biggest issue with um, using the Android and iOS support is for phone specific features. We actually, we talked about this earlier in the session. Um, I got a question about, you know, what does it support doing calls? Does it support different specifics for the phones? And but the RoboVM and the JavaFX ports guys are adding in support for phone specific features, but they're creating their own APIs on top of the OpenJFX APIs. They're not all supported equally across the platforms. And Johan's trying to do this, but they want to converge on a common platform. So you don't have to write different variations of your code for different cell phones. So it's, I would say this is like emerging technology, bleeding edge stuff, but I think it's cool. Okay, so let's take one more question and then I think I should, <laughs> Nicholas and I should take a chance to introduce our next um, part of the presentation. I have a yeah. question. Are you recommending using Java FS FX and uh, Robo VM to develop uh, application on iOS or just stick with Objective C or something else? Um, okay, repeat the question because I was distracted. Sorry. Yes, yeah, my question is: is uh, to develop application on iOS, it's you recommended use Java FX and uh, Robo VM or use Objective something else? Okay, so are you, are you a Java developer? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, good practice. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think it's an exciting option. But, um, you know, give it a try first. Don't, don't, um, don't, don't, sell, don't, don't, don't fire all your iOS developers at your company yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, what I'm going to do for the stream is I'm going to cut the stream and then re-record so we get a separate presentation for this. And then it'll also give me a chance to, um, I want to rewire the network hub so that we can talk to the now from the same computer we're broadcasting so I don't have the same double laptop issue. So for folks who are on the live stream, we're going to kill you and then we'll re restart. <laughs>